Welcome to the One Church Podcast. Within this podcast, you'll encounter content that will instill hope, fortify your faith, offer practical, real-life insights, spread the love of Jesus, and inspire you to fulfill your unique purpose. Now, please stay tuned as we prepare to delve into this week's message. Turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. We're going to read a few verses in chapter 11, verse 25, and then we're going to skip down to verse 34 through 36. Verse 25, and then going to verse 30, verses 34 through 36. When you have it, say amen. amen. Awesome. Romans chapter 11, verse 25, it reads like this. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have, have hard hearts. But this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. How many of you can attest to that? For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him exists by his power, and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless the reading of the word and speak to us this morning. You may be seated in the house of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. We continue our Roman series. If you're here for the first time, we've been in the Romans, the book of Romans, the letter that Paul wrote to the book or the church in Rome, sorry, and he wrote this letter to that church in Rome, and he's been uh, speaking to them through this letter. This is one of the hardest letters uh, people say, theologians say, preachers say, uh, Friday night groups, teachers say, this is hard. Can we praise God for the last few weeks of teachers that we had on Friday nights? And there's many more to come, so we're not going to release names. I told, I heard we're not supposed to say any names. So, uh, but thank God for, uh, let's give a hand to praise God for Stanley and Vivek. Come on, praise God for Stanley, Vivek, Susan, Janice, and Sharon and Charisma. Praise God. Praise God. And there's more to come this Friday as well. But today I want to ask us to... Uh, have our hearts, minds, ears open to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us from this next portion in the book of Romans. This message is titled, part four is titled, Saved and Unashamed. If you're taking notes, which we encourage you to, Saved and Unashamed. Saved and Unashamed. How many of us are saved and unashamed? (laughs) Say, be careful how we answer. Say, how many of us are saved and unashamed? Praise God. Amen? And we'll see how we can be and we were called to be saved and unashamed. Chapter 8, or last week, we ended off on what we would call a a glorious summit. Last week, the Lord uh, moved in a powerful way and uh, I was just sharing whatever the Lord gave to me in that moment, and many of you shared that they, you needed that. Many of you shared testimonies of even prophetic words that were spoken uh, into that moment, and the Lord was speaking to your life, and you only know, and God only knows what God ministered to you in your life. Amen? So as the Lord was continuing to minister, you come to the end of chapter 8 on such a glorious note, like nothing can separate me from the love of God. How many of you are thankful that nothing can separate you from the love of God? We love that fact. We love that reality. We love that truth in the Word of God, but chapter 9 comes from the mountaintop summit to a deep valley low and says, oh my goodness, wait a minute, God doesn't love Israel? How can you say nothing can separate us in chapter 8 and then goes into chapter 9 saying, hey, there's a, the Israelites decided to not believe and receive God as who he was and then God decided to harden their hearts. That makes, could make us wonder, I'm not saying it does, it could make us wonder, if God did it to Israel, could he do it to us? Could he have a hard heart, or could he be not merciful if, as we think it is, but we're going to learn that he is actually merciful. In chapters 1 through 8, Paul is trying to convince us about our need for God, the gospel, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. 
In chapters 9, 10, and 11, which we're going to be traveling through and focusing on today, I want to ask us to remind ourselves that, hey, Paul is taking a little detour in this message that he's been uh, putting out through chapter 8. And he's saying, Let's, let me turn your attention back to the people I chose. Let me t- tell you a little bit about the people that God had called the Israelites or the Jewish nation. In Romans chapter 9, verse 2, as we read in verse 11, so pay attention to verse 11, chapter 11, sorry, verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Verse 34 through 36, I'm going to read it one more time. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Anyone know the mind of the Lord? Anyone? Here, can anyone, anyone know the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? How, can we counsel God? Can we give him advice? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? Meaning who has given to God so much that God owes us something? Let me make it clear. We cannot counsel God. We cannot advise God. We can't even understand the fullness of who God is, what he does, but also why he does what he does. How many of you have ever asked the question, why does bad things happen to good people? Can we make sense of the fact, I'm just going to use your testimony, why God would call Sandosh and Susan to that calling and assignment to raise that child called Philip, and at the time of 19 years old, that he would call him home. Can we make sense of that? I don't know if they ever will. I'm sure you've asked a lot of questions. Many have asked a lot of our own questions, haven't we? Why are we going through this? Why have we experienced this? Why am I not experiencing that? I want to encourage you. We could have all the questions we want, and we may not ever have all the answers. Because God has a plan, and God will fulfill his plan. Amen? Yeah, praise God for he has a plan. God has a plan, folks. We love to plan our stuff and our lives out, but sometimes our life doesn't go according to our plan. And sometimes we have to realize maybe this is the plan of God for us. And we have to come to the reality. If it is the plan of God, the earlier I submit to the plan of God, the earlier that I embrace the plan of God, the earlier that I can just enjoy the plan of God, then I would not have to fight the plan of God. Amen? The Lord enabled us to hear last week, live out your calling, embrace your calling, don't run away from your calling. Amen? Embrace what God has put inside of you, enjoy what God has called you for, and don't run away from it. I'm telling you, life may never be perfect and it will not be, but I'm telling you, you can have a joyful life. Spirit of the living God, you and I can have a joyful life if we're submitted to the plan of God. And that's why here Paul is saying, we cannot counsel God. We cannot be his advisor. We cannot even understand God. So he wraps up chapter 11 with those questions and with that statement. It's all a mystery to us, folks. It's all a mystery to us. And we have to be okay with the mystery of God, the mystery of God's plan in our lives. (laughs) I wish I could plan out next month. I wish I could plan out next year. I wish. We like to plan things out. But at the same time, we must submit the plans before the Lord and let the Lord's will be fulfilled, as the Bible teaches. So in Romans chapter 11, he's asking us and challenging us not to consider ourselves too prideful and arrogant and ignorant to think that we know it all. God knows everything. We know glimpses. And God knows what he's going to fulfill in our life at the right time. In Romans chapter 9, I bring you to the early parts of chapter 9. Paul is saying it like this. Uh, Verse 2, Paul is saying, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. (laughs) He came off of chapter 8 with so, so much joy and hope. And he starts chapter 2 with, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. 
For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises? Verse 5. Of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all and eternal, the eternally blessed God. Amen. Amen. Paul is saying here, basically, I am willing to be cut off from Christ for my fellow man. I am willing to be cut off from Christ. This is a man that had a personal revelation and personal encounter, and I had a personal moment with God, and he had a true revelation of who God is. God knocked him off his high horse, literally, and brought him down to a low point, made him blind, and then revealed himself to Paul. And Paul is saying, I had all that. I have Christ right now. I preach Christ, but I'm willing to give it all up if I could save my fellow countrymen. Ah, uh, <laughs> how many of us are willing to say, Put me in hell so others could go to heaven. That's basically what Paul is saying there. Cut off from Christ. How many of us are willing? Don't answer, don't answer. How many of us are willing to say, put me in hell so that somebody else can go to heaven? It's hard. I don't know if it's possible. I had to ask myself, do I love my fellow countrymen that much? Do I love people that much? Say, take away Christ. Take me away from Christ. Cut me off from Christ so that my fellow country, my, Paul is saying, for my fellow Jews can believe in what God is calling them to. Do I love people this much? Am I willing to be cursed for my own people? Any people, unchurched people, de church people, the prodigals, the sinners, the saints. Am I willing to be cut off from Christ so that somebody else can be saved? That's what Paul is challenging us here. But he's saying in verse 4, who are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises? And I want us to really put ourselves in that situation. Many of us have been blessed with so many things that we did not deserve. Many of us have been blessed with so many opportunities that we had nothing to do with. Many of us are sitting in the house of God because generations ago, one person, a few people, maybe a family made a decision to say, we're giving everything else up for the sake of Christ. Huh? We have been blessed with covenants. We have been blessed with the glory of God. We have been blessed with the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of God. We have been blessed with the Lord himself. Many of us. I'm not saying all. Many of us. But because it was handed to us in a silver platter, we've taken it for granted. We've taken coming to church for granted. We've come come into the presence of God personally for granted. Because that's all we did growing up maybe. All we did was family prayers and prayer meetings in church. And I, I want to encourage each and every one of us. Don't take for granted the blessings of God that you and I did not deserve but we did receive. Amen. Amen? And even to the generations now, second, third, fourth generations, I want to speak into your life right now. You have been blessed to grow up in the house of the Lord. You have been blessed to grow up in godly families maybe. And I want to tell you that you should not take this for granted. You have an opportunity to receive and respond to the call of God, the presence of God, and the plan of God on your life. Do not take it for granted and let somebody else enjoy what God has set apart for you they got the glory the Israelites got the glory the literal glory of God was in front of them but they still rejected them God 
They had the manna from heaven and they saw the miraculous hands of God all through their generation. But they still rejected him. They received the law of God. They received the handwritten law of God on some stones and they still rejected him because that was not enough. They received the covenant of God, the Adamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant. They received covenants that were established generations prior to them and it will be ever everlasting covenants. It was not a contract that God made like we get into now. It was a covenant meaning that if you get into a covenant relationship, regardless of how much we we veer off, how much we detour, God will still fulfill his covenant with you, your family, and your generations. You may not experience it like a lot of Israelites didn't, but God has to still keep his covenant to his people. You may not experience all that God had planned for you, But God will make sure that if he keeps a covenant, that he will come through on that covenant. Not just to feel good promises of God, but to fulfill the covenant of God. Not for you to have enjoyment. Not for you to enjoy about on this life. Not for you to say, look what the Lord has done. But for God to say, look what I have done. And it was all for my glory, God says. Spirit of the living God, help me. He's given it all. (laughs) He's given it all. But why do we still reject him? Why do we still disobey him? Why do we still run away from him? In Romans chapter 9, we continue to see Paul is saying and clearing it up for everyone. Because there were some namesake Israelites. There was some namesake Pentecostals. There were some namesake, label-ridden Christians. There were some form-filling religious Christians. You know, there's the church, the big church, and then there's a remnant inside the church. There is the big church, and then there's the remnant that God is looking for. There is the big church, and there is a remnant that is looking after God. There is the big church that fills off everything on the forms that fills off everything for statistics but I'm telling you right now God is coming back soon and he's looking for a bride that is blemishless and a remnant that is seeking after God and all that he is and all that he stands for (laughs) there were namesake Israelites Paul is saying there was a bunch of people that had the name of Israelites but they had no connection with Israel or God wow Talk about a, uh. if we have a namesake reality of relationship with God, may the Lord help us today to shake off those labels. Spirit of the living, shake off those labels and really get into now a pure relationship with the Lord. That I don't need a label of Christian. I don't need a label of Pentecostal. I don't need a label of this or that. I need a label of a child of God running after pursuing Jesus Christ for all he is. That's all I want. I promise you this. I don't know if I love you enough to go to hell. Georgia, you love Janice enough to go to hell? Sorry to put you on the spot. (laughs) Newly, I got to see a couple of newlyweds in the crowd here too. So I don't know if you newlyweds were ready to give up your spouse for the hell so that they could be saved. I see some old times believers here too. I see some single people, but I also sense there are some first generation Christians in the house of God as well. I'm thankful for the generational Christians, but I'm thankful for the first time believer that said out of all of my lineage and heritage, I have the privilege to know Jesus Christ for myself. And I stepped out all by myself and I said, I'm going to serve this Lord no matter what it means, no matter what it looks like, no matter who leaves me, no matter who stays, I am going to decide to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And I want to testify today. My mom is one of those Christians. My my mom is one of those people that said, oh, I don't even know what my family is going to think. She was away from home. Maybe she was a better spot to do it. But she did it. 
I'm th- you hear me talking about my dad and all that stuff, but I'm telling you, he had a little privilege because his father made that decision and they got to grow up in that. I'm thankful for the si- both sides in our family because my mom made a personal decision all by herself, forgetting about all her family and all her lineage and all that she grew up in. She said, I saw the Lord and he is my savior. And because of that reality, her generations and generations, she is a first generation believer. Somebody here else is a first generation believer. I'm telling you right now, you may not see it now, you may not see it now, but you will taste and see that the Lord is good. Give him a praise, somebody. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you for saying yes. I'm looking around this sanctuary. You, many of you, God, you're going to say thank you. Somebody's going to tell you thank you for saying yes. Thank you for saying yes. But please, after you say yes, don't go back to the labels and namesake Christians. Please, just if anything, don't be labeled anything that the world wants to put. Just say, I am a child of God. Oh, I am a child of God. I am a born again, redeemed, saved, water baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ, filled and strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit, living a holy life according to the will and the word of God, submitted to the word of God completely, not to any ideology or teaching of any pastor or church, but submitted to the word of God. And if you don't belong in a church that preaches the word of God, find one that does. But I'm telling you right now, you got to make that decision. And if you do, your generations will say, thank you for saying yes spirit of the living God no more namesake Christianity please the Bible tells me like hey as a pastor when you get to heaven you're accountable for the souls that you were entrusted with oh my God I'm looking through this crowd I'm accountable for each and every one of you but I can't save you Jesus can only do that you're looking to the wrong people You're looking to the wrong people. Pick up your eyes and look to Jesus. You're looking to the wrong people. Oh, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. But you're looking to the wrong people. Lord, help us to look to you. Keep our eyes fixed on you. Share, you can't save me, baby. You can't save our kids. I can't help you too much. I can walk with you. I can guide you. But I'm telling you, you got to look to Jesus. Abby, Kayla, Lily, I'm telling you, I can only do so much, babies. But I can't save you. I can't help you. Only God can take you to eternity. I'm telling you, don't look to your husband. Don't look to your data. Don't look to your pastor. Look to Jesus. God chooses. I wish I could make sense of how God works. Chapter 9, 10, 11, God said, I, I spoke to Pharaoh. I hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Who did it? A merciful, loving God couldn't save Pharaoh. God chose to harden the heart of Pharaoh so that God's plan could be fulfilled. Amen? Amen? God chose to be merciful. It says, the Bible says, God chooses to be merciful to whom he wants to be shown mercy. Verse 16, let's go there. Verse 14, I start with, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. Come on. There's no unrighteousness with God. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something. Let me clear something up for all of us. Stop questioning what the Lord does with your life and other people's life. If the Lord decides to do something to show mercy and or grace, that is the Lord's doing. That is the Lord's decision. And all we can do is submit to it, celebrate it, or we decide what else we want to do. But when the Lord shows mercy, it's not that he's fair, unfair, or more than fair. I have three kids and I have to battle with, that's not fair. Why did they do that? I'm not calling any names. Why did they do that? Why, why, why didn't I get the, the, all these things? Sometimes life isn't fair. God isn't fair. God is merciful. 
You see, mercy, like we understood, is that we don't get something that we deserve, right? We deserve to be, let's just use it for easy example, we deserve to be punished, but we were not punished. That's not God being fair, that's God being merciful. If he was obligated to show mercy, then it's not mercy anymore, it's obligation. It's not about God being fair, folks. It's about God choosing to do what he wants to do with who he wants to do it, when he does it, that's God's decision. How many of you are thankful that God isn't fair with us, but he's just merciful and gracious? (laughs) If he was fair, oh my God. (laughs) Right, Pastor Joe? If he was fair, what we would be? What did you just say? You're You're done. If he was fair, we'd be done. All of us pack our bags, go home. Let's call it a day. God, come back right now and maybe we'll get right. Right before communion happens, we'll get right. Oh, that's not what everyone does? Oh, 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 oh. But God isn't fair. He's a merciful God. And he chooses who, how, and when he shows mercy. And when he does it, that's on God. That's why we don't have to be ashamed of God's mercy. That's why we don't have to be ashamed of God's grace. Amen? That's God's doing. And here's another thing. When you see the favor of God, that's also God. When you see the grace of God, that is also God. There's nothing for us to decide. There's nothing for us to do but just say, thank God for the favor of God. Even I've heard that phrase, favor ain't fair. That's God. He chooses it. He chose Pharaoh. It goes on to say, what about the potter? Does the, pot, does, does the clay decide what it's used for? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Mold me and make me after thy will. I'm messing up the lyrics. But he said, thou art the potter, I am the clay. I'm the clay. What he decides to do with me, that's on the potter. All I can say is stay on the wheel. And stay in the hands of God. And let God be the potter and let him use us as the clay for the glory of God. (laughs) We move to chapter 10. I got to close. Saved and unashamed in verse, chapter 10, verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. I want to ask us for testimony time for 30 seconds. If you put your belief and your faith and you gave your heart to the Lord, and if he's ever put you to shame, don't praise God. But if he's never put you to shame, can we just testify and thank God? Yeah. Close your eyes if you need to. Close your eyes. You don't need to see anyone else's. If you know that God has never put you to shame, when we have put ourselves to shame, when we have put ourselves in shameful positions, when we could have put, been put to shame privately, publicly, but God had mercy on us and said, I will never put you to shame. Can we just praise God? Take another 20 seconds in this house. Take another 10 seconds in this house. Come on. If he's never put you to shame, can we just praise God? Give him an unashamed praise in this moment. Hallelujah. He's never put you to shame. Hallelujah. Verse 9 and 10, basically connecting our heart and our mouth. Our heart and our mouth. Guard our hearts for what comes from it will come through the mouth. Our heart and our mouth. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Believe righteousness has received in your life. Believe that in your heart. Confess with your mouth that you receive salvation when you declare Jesus Christ as Lord. You and I are called to be saved and unashamed. In verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Spirit of the living God. Folks, I want to, if you didn't know this already, pastors are not the only preachers. We have an assignment and a calling to preach and declare the word of God. 
But we as a church have made it clear to all of us, even through practical things throughout the summer and throughout this year, we've tried to equip the saints of God. Like Ephesians 4 says, equip the saints to be what God has called you to be, the gospel carriers of Jesus Christ. The gospel carriers and messengers of Jesus Christ. You and I are the preacher. Come on, somebody put your hand over your heart. Come on, put somebody a hand over your heart. Say, I am the preacher. Come on, Rio, I am the preacher. Come on, Usha, I am the preacher. Come on, Sarah, I am the, come on, come on. Uh, Lily, come on, hand over your heart and say, I am the preacher. Yeah, I am the preacher. You are the preacher. That you can share the good news with somebody else. For saved, so bring this to a wrap and a close. Somebody messaged me. <laughs> Somebody messaged me during the week, sent me something on Instagram and said, this is what happens when a pastor says this is a wrap and close. It takes another 15 minutes. I promise not to. As a saved Christian believer in Jesus Christ, I want to close with this. You have to make sure that you know that as soon as you call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, you're not only standing in the righteousness of God, justified by Jesus and through his blood and through his righteousness, right? Justified, redeemed, and now standing. But you are now opened yourself up to the attacks of the enemy. You have opened yourself up to the act. If you were not, it's okay. But I'm thankful that I get to stand justified in Christ, boldly, humbly, by the grace of God. I can stand here, but as a saved Christian, we must also understand we open ourselves up to the attacks of the enemy. And when we are under attack by the enemy, I want to challenge every believer in this place. Do not be surprised. I'm just giving you that as a Heads up, don't be surprised when the enemy attacks. He's not going to attack somebody that is not standing with Christ. He's not going to attack anyone that's not standing for the Lord or standing in the relationship with Christ. He's only going to attack his enemies. His enemies are God and his children. I'm telling you right now, don't be surprised when the enemy attacks. The enemy will attack that's what he's doing, Look, prowling around like a roaring lion. But you have to stand in the reality that you do have the lion of Judah with you and that you can stand in his grace, in his mercy, and you can just stand there saying you can have and be a believer. Let the attacks come, but God is going to take the glory. God is going to protect. God is going to heal. God is going to strengthen, and God is going to stand for you. Don't be surprised, church. I just want to leave you with that warning. Don't be surprised when the attacks come. But I want to also encourage you. If and when it comes or if it doesn't come, can we still have and be unashamed in our praying? Can we still be unashamed in our praising? Can we still be unashamed in our worshiping? Can we still be unashamed in our giving? Can we still be unashamed in our life? Can we still be unashamed as a worshiper before the Lord? An unashamed worship. An unashamed prayer. An unashamed praise that I give to the Lord in this house. Thanks for joining us this week on the One Church Podcast. Be sure to tune in next week. If you are ready to start a relationship with Jesus and commit your life to Him, please contact us at info at onechurchonline.com. We hope you found value in this podcast, and we'd appreciate if you would share us with others and tell your family and friends to follow along. Our prayer and hope is that this podcast can reach countless lives. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram, Subscribe to our YouTube and Spotify channels at One Church LI and visit us at our website, onechurchonline.com. Here at One Church, our vision is to see Jesus. We exist to reach the one with the love of Jesus and for all to live like Jesus. We want to see Jesus in each other and we pray and believe that there is more for you.